In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The heat of the sun warms his face as he goes out for a morning walk near home. He sits along a stone wall by the side of the road. This is his place. He works from here. The stones he touches are already growing warm, taking in the heat of the day. He can hear the voices of people he has known all his life as they pass by. Many birds are in the air. Some are singing, first a grackle, then a kingfisher, and finally a flock of sparrows. He can tell them apart by the tone and cadence of their chirping. A dozen smells in the, ha- in the air hit him all at once. Fresh baked bread, mud on the path from the storm of the night before, the stench of animals and the scent of fresh cut grain. He takes in the world deeply, though he has never actually seen a sunrise or the face of his neighbors or the beauty of a sparrow alighting on a branch. He has never seen the sight of a woman kneading bread, the falling rain, or how, sh- how cute sheep can actually be when they are not being difficult. He has never seen anything because he is blind. He was born that way. We human beings are given five senses, taste, smell, hearing, touch, and sight. When we lose one of these, the others compensate, I am told. So this man hears, smells, tastes, and touches his way through life. He has learned how to live in a world that is rigged for people who are sighted, for people who can see. One day, though, as out of nowhere, he meets a man named Jesus with mud that he made from spitting into sand. He gives him sight. He rubbed that mud on his eyes and said, go wash, wash in the pool of Siloam. And he received his sight. He returns to his community whole and restored. However, the reaction is anything but celebratory. In fact, the power of what God has done in him disturbs pretty much everybody. The fact that he was blind and sees is entirely lost on them. They want to know how it is that he received this sight. He doesn't know. He doesn't. Really, he doesn't. All he knows is that a man named Jesus put mud on his eyes and said, go wash. He said this repeatedly to his neighbors, to the religious leaders, and to his parents. He washed and was restored to his senses, all five of them, and not a single soul has stopped to give thanks and praise for the gift of new life that is in him, as though they're all constitutionally wedded to the idea that he stayed down there. No one came up to him and said, I'm happy for you, man. Not a soul paused to ask him, so what's it like? Is it how you imagined it would be, that stone wall, this village, the animals around us, the grains blowing in the field? Does the sun look as amazing as it feels in the heat of the day? No joy, no celebration, no awe and wonderment. It's like this huge, powerful wave rolls over this man's life, and no one catches it. In fact, they're not even aware that there's a wave at all. This is how they all respond, the disciples themselves. They're walking through town, and there's the man sitting right there, and they start having a conversation in front of him as though he's not even there. Oh, Jesus, so, like, take this blind guy over here. Is it his sin or the sin of his parents? that he's like this in this state. His neighbors do the same. They're all talking about him. He's right there. They're talking about him as though he's not even in front of him. Oh, this is the man that used to sit and beg. I can't be sure. As though perhaps, and how sadly, they never even really noticed him all that well before, that they don't even remember his features. The religious leaders, they treat him like a thug and a criminal. They abusively interrogate him. 
They say terrible things about Jesus and are obsessed about how he has healed him on the Sabbath and only somebody who is evil could do something like that. And his own parents, his own parents, riveted in fear, riveted in fear, cannot even celebrate. This man was born blind. He is your son, yes? Ask him. Ask him. He is of age. We're not going to take any responsibility. We're not going to stand with him in this moment. It's simply incredible. I can't help but think that maybe by this point, the man himself is beginning to question the good that has happened to him. Who is this Jesus? Maybe something bad has happened to me. When Jesus comes into the life of a person or a community, all limitations are off the table. Formerly held restrictions and rules that keep people down, hurt, are lifted. That is what he does. That is what Jesus does. He lifts the boulders that weigh us down and gives us freedom. For Nicodemus, it was meaning. For the woman at the well, it was dignity. And for this man born blind, it is not just his sight, but belonging and the possibility of a new future filled with hope. The funny thing is that in the face of this newness, and the power of possibility that Jesus represents, many retreat and recoil. Some are disturbed. Jesus offers newness and life, and we very often say, thank you very much, I'm going to cling to my old, deadened ways. We cling to what we know. Scripture scholar Walter Brueggemann suggests that we are addicted to what he calls the old managed truth the old managed truth, the stuff that keeps everything in place and under control, like our compulsion to have all the answers, to maintain rules that are unjust and make no sense, like healing on the Sabbath, the world of privilege and power that keeps some up and others down, market ideologies that reduce life to owning and having and eating, or the images given us from our parents or others that keep us from the freedom and joy of God's love. What is this old managed truth to which we cling? When we began the season of Lent a month ago on Ash Wednesday, we were invited into a time of self-examination. If we have not done so, perhaps today's gospel propels us to do so. What deadens our lives, yours and mine? What is the old managed truth to which we are clinging? I think sometimes for me it's just a basic lack of trust in God's goodness that leads to a life too often lived from a place of anxiety and fear. Sometimes it simply is that I need to live within the illusion of being in control and the ability and ability to embrace ambiguity, trusting that God has my back. Old managed truth takes many forms. It is unique to each of us, but one thing that I generally find true is that managing it, nurturing it, holding on to it is exhausting and can only drive us deep into a way of being that is neither free nor life-giving. Perhaps it seems easier to live with our own deformed and limited visions for ourselves in this world than to embrace God's vision of newness and hope. We can embrace such a choice, and on and off in this sojourn through life we will, in fact, do so. However, if we dare, we can embrace the life and hope that is given to us by the one who made mud, smeared it on the eyes of a man born blind, and told him to go wash in Siloam. Be forewarned, when we encounter Jesus and we are transformed, we will be changed. And perhaps some, some may not like that very much. A few may even protest our newfound freedom. We may even find it challenging for ourselves because change is not always easy. However, be assured that with this change, this newness comes good, joy, and freedom because our God is not content for us to live in a deadened state 
of old managed truth, of fear and lifelessness, mere survival. Jesus longs for us to have lives that are touched deeply by hope and abundant joy. We gather here in this place to reclaim that for us and for the people we walk with and for our neighbors. We come to this table to celebrate this life that is ours and this Jesus that stands in the midst of the old managed truth and offers us hope. Today in this Eucharist, we also celebrate another way of touching and experiencing God's hope. And in just a moment, I'm going to invite anyone who would like to experience that to come forward, a simple prayer of healing, a simple anointing prayer with God's holy oil, praying with you for what's on your mind, for who's on your mind, that God's joy and abundance may be all of ours. May our God who in Jesus unleashes love into the world, unleash his love for us that we may see, that we may grow, that we may live. Amen.